Let us take a moment to pray. Pray, Lord, that as we had sang Hosanna, that the words were coming from our hearts, not just from our mouths. Heal my heart, make it clean, and open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Lord, I pray those are words that we are really singing from our hearts. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom cause. I pray, Lord, that we are living lives that are intended to glorify you. That we are here today to worship, to glorify you. To remember who you are, lift up your name, celebrate who you are. I pray for a blessing today, Lord, on this message. I pray, Lord, that you would speak through me, that you would speak to those that are here. Touch us, Lord, in a mighty way. Have your way in our hearts and in our lives today. I just thank you so much, Lord, for your presence here, for your promises, for your holy word, for the Holy Spirit, for the life of Jesus. May we be eternally grateful, Lord. It is in your Son, Jesus Christ's name that I pray. Amen. So as you know, we are continuing our study of Joseph. And I'm going to take a moment just to kind of catch you up to where we are in the story. Uh, for those of you who learn better and who hear better by actually going through the scripture yourself, the primary scripture today is going to be in uh, Genesis chapter 42. All of the scriptures that I'm going to be, be quoting will actually be on the PowerPoint as well for those who just want to listen. But I want to remind you that Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold into slavery. From that point, he went on to work for Potiphar. And we don't get a great sense of exactly how many years that he was in Potiphar's household. But we do know that he left there in some disgrace because of a lie that Potiphar's wife had told upon him. He then spent some years in prison. And then the scripture lets us know that he was 30 years old, 30 years old by the time that Pharaoh had him to interpret his dreams and that he began to work as the second in command to Pharaoh. Just as Joseph had said, just as the dream had predicted, there were then seven years of bumper crops. And during that time, Joseph systematically gathered the extra crops, stored them around the cities where they were growing in preparation for the famine that they knew would be coming. During that time of bumper, bumper crops, Pharaoh gives him a wife, and he ends up having two sons. It is at the beginning of chapter 42 that we know that the famine has begun. And it's during that time that Jacob says to his sons, what are you doing here? We know that there is grain in Egypt, and I need you to go. I need you to go and get something for our families. And he sends 10 of his sons. You know that there are 11 that are there in Canaan with him, but he sends 10. And it is those 10 who actually approach Joseph. And you know that there are many countries and peoples that were coming to Egypt specifically to buy grain. It is very likely that not all of them had to see Joseph personally. So it was a divine coincidence, if you will, that Joseph was there at the time that his brothers show up. And that's the scenario that Pastor Mike talked about last week. It all begins with Joseph encountering his brothers, he recognizing them, but they not recognizing him. Joseph accuses his brothers of being spies. And a lot of dialogue happens where they reveal part, at least, of their heritage and their story as a people. Nonetheless, he puts them into custody for three days. 
We are then at Genesis 42, 18. The scripture reads, On the third day, Joseph said to them, his brothers, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison, while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me, so that your words may be verified, and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. I like it that Joseph takes a moment that says, for I fear God. I struggled with why he would put that in the midst of the things that he was saying, but I, I believe that he meant it to say that I'm going to be a man of my word. It was almost as if he were swearing by God. Please understand that if you prove to be what you say you are and who you say you are, then I will also prove that I'm a man of my word. What's interesting at this point, though, in verse 21, the brothers, they said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. One of the most fascinating things about Rochester has been is that it is a community of immigrants. That there are so many refugee families from so many parts of the world that actually come to Rochester. I mean, it's almost Rochester's unique signature. There are many days when I'm at the hospital where we'll have five people in labor and four of them do not speak English because they have come here from different parts of the world. It's always kind of uncomfortable though because there are times when they begin to speak to themselves or speak to their family members and they assume that they are having a private conversation even though you are standing by. I remember as a kid, we thought that pig Latin was so complicated. <laughs> and you were going to sneak and say something in front of your parents, which you thought they would not understand. So here's a moment where his brothers are talking, and they don't think that they actually have an audience, when in fact, they do. And so it, in some ways, it's kind of a, a, a caution to you to be careful. If you really want to have something to be in secret or private, you should do it in perhaps a different setting. But what's wonderful about this conversation is it reveals that Joseph's brothers had not forgotten what they'd done. They hadn't forgotten. They recognized that what they'd done to Joseph was wrong. That in fact, they were guilty of what they'd done to Joseph. They remember how distressed that he was and how he pleaded for his life. Reuben even reminds them that he had tried unsuccessfully to dissuade them from sinning against Joseph. And this is really kind of a magnificent thing to hear because not everybody who does things wrong recalls it, remembers it, has reminders, has any guilt, has any feelings about it, whatsoever. This touched Joseph in a special way. He turned away from them and he began to weep, but then turned back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. You know, when Joseph got married, he had two sons. And I want to remind you that their names had great meaning to him. And they made great statements about the life of Joseph. The older son he called Manasseh, which meant forgetting. And for a long time, I didn't really understand why would you name your son Manasseh? But what Joseph was trying to say was that he was letting go of his past. He was letting go of the pain of the things that had been done to him. 
that in fact he had decided from that moment on that he was moving forward. He was no longer stuck in that spot. He didn't literally forget all that had happened to him, but in fact, he was moving on to a different place. Ephraim meant twice fruitful, because not only had he now become fr fruitful in his natural life, but in many ways he had become fruitful in his psychological and emotional life as well. By this, Joseph was declaring that his life was no longer defined by the pain of his past. And this is enormous. He was no longer going to be defined by that. Nonetheless, it touched him to hear his brothers discuss how they had treated him 20 years earlier. It was a reminder of that painful place in his life. In verse 25, Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack, and to give them provisions for their journey. After this was done, they loaded their grain on their donkeys, and they left. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in the mouth of his sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brother. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank, and they turned to each other, trembling, and said, What is this that God has done to us. Think about it. In spite of the fact that he appeared to be speaking harshly to them before, when he accused them of being spies, he made sure that they had appropriate grain, he gave them back their silver, and he made provisions for this journey, which could have been 250 to 300 miles. Traveling with donkeys and grain, this was not an overnight trip. This was not a weekender, right? It certainly was not a vacation. This was a tremendous undertaking, traveling from Egypt to Canaan with donkeys and grain. Joseph took care of his brothers. He provided for his family that he knew was in Canaan. And of course, since they don't know his perspective, they are panicked now because it will appear by all accounts that they've stolen the grain rather than paid for it. They went there with the intention to buy it, and they have no explanation of why the silver is still in their possession. So they ask the question, what is this that God has done to us? What's fascinating is that there is no point in time when we get a sense that the brothers are godly men. We have no information about their spiritual condition at all. Yet, they express some insight here into their current situation. They recognize that God may be calling them into account for their past sin. They have no reason to suspect that this is coming from the governor of Egypt personally but in fact, God may be calling them to account. You see, they had lived with a secret for 20 years. 20 years they'd been carrying around this secret. They had watched their father mourn. They had wrestled with their own guilt. And they thought the time of Bruce had come. Numbers 30. Numbers 20, excuse me, 32, 23 says, your sin will find you out. Your sin will find you out. You don't have a secret sin. I love it when people think that they're getting away from, with things, that it's all covered, that it's hidden, perhaps. It's just a matter of time. Our sins always find us out. As a matter of fact, Psalm 69, 5 says, You know my folly, O God. My guilt is not hidden 
from you. Very often when you think you have a secret, your secret is with the devil. But God knows. And we all know as well that there is a time of accountability coming. It's just a matter of when. It may be a matter of how, but it's not a matter of if. It all happens. How did this horrible situation come to be? I looked up some information on the green-eyed monster because I was curious as to where the phrase came from. There are so many phrases that we use and we have no idea of their, of their um, origin. So this is what I learned. The Hebrew word for envy is kina, and it referred to a burning color in the face produced by deep emotion. The Greeks believed that jealousy was accompanied by an overproduction of bile, leading to a yellowish green pallor. They actually felt like when these things happen, because of bilious regurgitation in you, your color would change. That's an interesting thing. But then later on, Shakespeare, in Shakespeare's play, Lago warns Othello to beware of jealousy. And he says this, it is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. So from that time on, people very um, regularly would ret refer to jealousy as the green-eyed monster. This green-eyed monster in this family situation was created by Jacob. It was created by Jacob because not only was Rachel his favorite wife, and don't get me wrong, in some ways I have sympathy for Jacob because Jacob saw Rachel as he was going into the land of his uncle and he fell in love with her almost instantly and he went specifically to his uncle and said I am willing to work for her to be my wife Laban then says give me seven years and Jacob did that with the express intent of getting Rachel but nobody had come for Leah in those seven years the older sister. And so when the time of marriage came, Leah was the one given, not the one requested or worked for. Now, I feel bad for Leah as well because she got caught in the mess. And no matter what she did, she was still not Rachel. So this scenario was a setup from the very, very beginning. And then Jacob works another seven years so that he can have Rachel. So, you know, Leah gives him children, the maidservant gives him children, another maidservant gives him children, and then finally, Rachel gives him Joseph. And that was really, really special to Jacob too special because from the beginning he showed that he loved Jacob more he gave him the coat he kind of had the insider position there were times when Jacob would send Joseph to do things in the field just so he could come back and tell him what was going on with the brothers so the scripture says they hated him over this issue of how much dad loves him now don't get me wrong siblings hate each other all the time right they fight with each other all the time. So when Jacob, and when Joseph was just being a normal teenager, and he would do things like, well, he tattled, or he tells them of the dream. First of the first dream and then the second dream, he was just being a normal teenager. I mean, people always talk about how he was boasting about the dream and those kind of things. We don't actually know that. Even he, if he shared the dream at all in their eyes, they saw him through the green-eyed monster. And I have to tell you, if you look through anything through the green-eyed monster, it's all bad. Right? When someone you basically don't like says anything, don't you see it differently than if someone you like says the same thing? So from the very start, this scenario was set up. But no matter how jealous you are of your brother, and no matter how nice his coat is, 
And no matter how much he tells you about a dream, is it a bit of an overreaction to actually throwing in a cistern and selling as a slave? Yes, that is still too much. That's taking the fight too far. Right? That is going too far. Scripture encourages us not to take revenge, but to leave room for God's wrath. You know, because Joseph is not the only person in the world who's ever been wronged. I'm sure a number of you in here have stories you could tell me of the ways that you have been wronged by people that you love or who should love you that you might trust, who might be close. Everyone has a story. In fact, scripture goes so far as to say, if your enemy is hungry, to feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And do not overcome evil, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Matthew 5 goes on to say, if you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes, causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You and I both know that this is nearly impossible to do. Without the grace of God, this is almost impossible to do. On your own, most of us will fail, and many of us in Joseph's position would relish the moment to get back at the brothers. What a divine appointment it would be, right? I can't wait to get my hands on the brothers. So you have to ask, why does Joseph behave in the way that he does? I personally don't think he ever had the intention of revenge. I don't. I think that Joseph really ultimately was giving them an opportunity for repentance he was looking forward to reconciliation and ultimately to the restoration of his family. He wanted it to be intact. But I have to tell you, forgiveness can be instant. Reconciliation is not. I can choose to forgive you in a moment, but we cannot restore what was broken that quickly. And for the reconciliation to really be as strong and vital as it can be, then it requires that we each take ownership of the things we have done wrong to one another. That's the best way of reconciling any situation. It's foolish to think that you can just say, well, from this moment we're all better, let's let it go. It doesn't work. Until you come clean, until you really repent. And this is true of our spiritual lives as, as well. We cannot continue to hold on to our sinful desires and habits and expect to be in good relationship with God. It just doesn't work. So you have to let things go. You have to genuinely repent. Romans 11.22 is a verse that I hadn't noticed before in this way. But it says, consider the kindness and the sternness of God. The kindness and the sternness of God. Very often we want to see love as just fluffy and yielding and always positive and ushy-gushy. But real love, mature love, very often is different than that. And I believe that's what Joseph had possessed. We've seen on many occasions, and we talk about love from 1 Corinthians 13, but I wanted to remind you of what the scripture says. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. 
this is the spot to which we are called. As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, <coughs> clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. If you just think about the, your own life, and your own sins, you know that this is true from God's perspective because the blood of Jesus is what cleansed us, us from our sins, whatever they might be. It's not that he's going to only forgive us for certain types of sins or that that's all that we've gotten, but we have gotten forgiveness for all of them because of the way God loves us. Joseph suffered a terrible injustice at the hand of his brothers. And in spite of the hardships he endured, he recognized the providence of God at work in his life. Over and over again in the scriptures, we kept seeing, but the Lord was with him and prospered him in these different situations. He had been enslaved and imprisoned for years. Keep in mind that there are 13 years between when he was first sent there, and when he gets his great position with the Pharaoh. He could have been filled with bitterness and anger. But God brought healing so that his past no longer dictated his future. And I want you to think about this. This is a place where many people get stuck in life, when the past continues to dictate the future. We give the past a lot of power if we allow it to control the future. But Joseph's past no longer defined his life. He was no longer a person that would say, I am a slave. I was sold as a slave by my brothers. Woe is me. He had been given victory over that. As I think about my own childhood, and I think about all the situations that existed, you know, my young childhood was marred by the sexual abuse, by domestic violence, by alcoholism, by poverty, by poor education. My heart and my mind through most of my young adult life and all of my childhood was filled with shame and anger and insecurity. That is how I would define those years. But God revealed himself to me in a really powerful way. And it was the love of God that mends the broken heart and mends the wounded soul. That's the power of the love of God. It's the love of God that softens the hard-hearted. It's the love of God that comforts those who are mourning and who are hurting. The beauty of this is, I have scars, but the scars no longer hurt. It's like the surgery that you had. You see the wound, but now you can touch it. You know what's happened. There's a visual there. You'll never forget. But it no longer is the source of pain. It's no longer dictating your route. It no longer has control over who you are. God did not change my circumstances. He changed me. He changed me, not my circumstances. And this was true of Joseph as well. Here he is, the second in command to Pharaoh. Did you ever wonder why he just didn't take a journey back to Canaan? He was still under the control of Pharaoh. Later on in the book of Genesis, three or four chapters later, he asks permission 
to go and bury his father. He was not living independently, even though he was in a position of power. He was not truly free. Those years imprisoned and enslaved had changed the course of his life forever. And he could have gotten stuck there, but he didn't. That's the love of God that changed Joseph. It's the love of God that changed me. It's the love and the power of God that can change you. And I pray that you've actually had an encounter with the God I'm talking about. Because I'm here because of the way he revealed himself to me. I don't know what you all are wrestling with. But I know who God is. And I know what he can do. And that's what new hope has to be about. Glorifying the God of heaven, who is capable of doing all things, who can change your very situation or can just change you in it. There's nothing like it. I need you all to be telling people the stories of your life. I need you to tell them what God is doing in your life, how you experienced the love of God, how his power within you has helped you to do things you cannot do on your own. I'd read about all kinds of things. There are tons of books that I read about the outcomes of abuse and of all these things and how you overcome as, as children of alcoholics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing worked like God did. Nothing. It wasn't counseling. It wasn't education. It wasn't even money. It wasn't stuff. It was God himself. The only thing that mattered. And I genuinely believe that if you took me back to that spot, take all the other things away, as long as God is still with me, I'm fine. I'm just fine. And Joseph was fine. That is the kind of love that conquers all things. And I pray that you get to experience it. Amen. We're going to pray again. In all of heaven and earth, Lord, there is none like you. Lord, I pray that you help us to focus on what really matters. Help us to see you through our circumstances. Help us, Lord, to actually bathe ourselves in the love which you so generously have given us, Lord. It is only in that way, Lord, that we can pour that love out, that love out to others, that we can really move on, Lord, that we can be restored, rejuvenated, revived, if you will. Touch us, Lord, afresh. Make us anew. Help us focus on you, Lord, knowing that we can do nothing without you, Lord. Help us to trust you, Lord, to do what we can't do on our own. I just thank you so much, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for this message. I thank you for this time that is here. And I pray, Lord, that you will bless everyone who hears this message, Lord. May they be drawn to you. Cleanse us, renew us, Lord. I just thank you so much, Lord, for your presence here. You are God alone. You are God alone. We lift our hearts and our hands to you, Lord. It is in Christ's name that I pray.